tonight, pain and healing. This is the last bit of stuff I have left of her. Their testimonies about their loved ones to a national inquiry opened up deep wounds. Are they getting the help they were promised? The government is planning to roll out the red carpet. The mood here in the UK on the eve of an unusual state visit. Could the timing be more awkward? And episode two of the latest great Canadian drama. The Raptors try to grip the series with a Kawhi Leonard-like claw. This is The National. Just hours from now, Canada confronts a record of violence and neglect. The National Inquiry into Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls makes its final report public tomorrow. The witnesses who detailed their pain and suffering paid a tremendous emotional cost. The report runs 1,200 pages based on written submissions plus testimony from 24 public hearings attended by more than 2,300 Canadians. On Friday, we reported some early details, and tomorrow we will, of course, bring you the full picture. But tonight, we're focusing on that awful burden borne by survivors. They've been offered counselling to help them cope. Olivia Stefanovic examines what's been done and what else they might need. Vanessa Brooks holds onto her sister's belongings closely as she packs her bag to attend the National Inquiry's closing ceremony. You're coming to Ottawa with me, Tanya. This is the last bit of stuff I have left of her. Tanya was murdered a decade ago. My sister was a very beautiful human being. Her life mattered. And I think that's the biggest message that I've been trying to convey is that these girls' life mattered. Brooks was one of hundreds of family members who testified at the National Inquiry. She says the inquiry's counseling and traditional healing services gave her strength. It means that Tanya is going to live on in the minds and the hearts of Canadians. Family members and survivors had the opportunity to create individualized therapy plans based on their needs, but not everyone took part. This was a harmful process. Maggie Seinwink wanted to testify about her sister, Sonia, who was killed 25 years ago in southwestern Ontario. But she says that in the end, she couldn't because the process was too top-down and not community-driven. This was based, not based on ceremony. It wasn't based on the protocols of Indigenous and Anishinaabe people. So I felt like it was, I was going into something that was foreign to me. Still, she's here to advocate for the families who didn't participate. And they should be allowed and they given that opportunity to have that support if they needed it. The federal government says it will provide counselling to families and survivors for one more year. What happens afterwards is unclear. It will be a matter of us sorting out based on what's in the report, uh, but also listening to families as to how we make sure that, uh, that families uh, um, feel supported in the best possible way. For Seinwink and Brooks, the inquiry may be over, but there is so much work left to do. There is no end date to what we do. Women continue to go missing and women continue to be murdered. Each hopes the governments respond with meaningful change that will make the difference between life or death. Olivia Stepanovich, CBC News, Ottawa. The report makes 231 recommendations, or what it has named calls for action. They include making sure there is safe and affordable transit for women living in remote communities, considering violence against Indigenous women as an aggravating factor when it comes time for sentencing, and ensuring Indigenous representation on police services boards, creating a national task force to review and, if needed, reinvestigate cases of missing and murdered women and girls. Our coverage continues tomorrow when the report is officially released in Gatineau, Quebec. You can expect to see the Prime Minister there as well as his ministers and, of course, some of the relatives of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls.
Conservative Party leader Andrew Scheer has demoted one of his MPs after we broke a story on the National last Thursday. Here's a reminder of what got that MP into hot water. Michael Cooper was part of a justice committee hearing testimony last week about online hate. Faisal Khan Suri, an Alberta Muslim leader, described the internet habits of the man who killed six people at a Quebec City mosque. The evidence from Business Computer showed he repeatedly sought content about anti-immigrant, alt-right and conservative commentators, mass murderers, U.S. President Donald Trump. Suri also referenced the massacre at two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. Cooper responded. First of all, Mr. Suri, I take great umbrage with your defamatory comments to try to link conservatism with violent and extremist attacks. Cooper cited the manifesto of the Christchurch killer to refute that shooter's supposed conservative leanings, telling Suri, So you should be ashamed. Other members objected. The committee met briefly in private. Then Cooper apologized in part. I, I will withdraw saying that he should be uh, ashamed, but certainly not the rest of what I said. David Cochran is here now with some fallout from the story you broke last week, David. Uh, this unfolded pretty quickly over the past couple of days. Yeah, Rosie, an election is just five months away, so Andrew Scheer had to move fast, and he's responded by stripping Michael Cooper of his seat on the House of Commons Justice Committee, posting his reasonings on Twitter. Here's what he said. Reading the name and quoting the words of the Christchurch shooter, especially when directed at a Muslim witness during a parliamentary hearing, is insensitive and unacceptable. Mr. Cooper has apologized. I accept his apology, and I can Consider the matter closed. Well, to this point, Cooper has refused to do any interviews, but he did post an apology on Twitter. Here's what he says. I quoted the words of a white supremacist anti-Muslim mass murderer in an ill-advised attempt to demonstrate that such acts are not linked to conservatism. I absolutely should have not quoted these words, nor named the perpetrator. This was a mistake. I apologize to Mr. Surrey and to all Canadians. I reiterate that I unequivocally condemn all forms of racism. And Rosie, what's interesting is that on the night we published this story, Michael Cooper retweeted a link to it. He's clearly had a change of heart. That tweet is now gone, as is his seat on the Justice Committee. All right, what does the witness, Mr. Surrey, have to say about all this? Well, we spoke to Mr. Surrey today, and he told CBC News that just stripping Cooper of his uh, committee uh, seat uh, can be seen as a slap on the wrist. He's still the deputy justice critic. He's still in the Conservative caucus. Mr. Surrey says maybe Cooper should lose both of those. Here's what he said. As our position, uh, and as Canadians, uh, we expect our leaders to hold themselves to a very high degree of standards. And uh, for such a member, should never be part of caucus and should never retain his position. And Rosie, that is a common reaction to the story online, especially expect to hear that from the Liberals. Okay. David Cochran, great reporting. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Let's shift gears now to what is shaping up to be a big week across the Atlantic, beginning tomorrow in the UK and then a few days from now in France. It promises to bring a real mixture of emotions and Adrian, you are in London tonight getting ready to lead our coverage on all of that. Yeah, that's right, Rosie. This week marks a really important anniversary, 75 years since Canadian soldiers helped storm the beaches of Normandy. It was a turning point in the Second World War and later this week on Juno Beach, those soldiers will be honored. But tonight we are in London's famous Piccadilly Circus where what is about to happen in this country has the nation's full attention. It is the much hyped state visit of Donald Trump. And as the CBC's Margaret Evans explains, the timing is a little awkward and if recent history is any indication, this visit could be a bit of a bumpy one. <laughs> The U.S. President Donald J. Trump visits London, take two. So what's to go wrong? Well, you couldn't describe the last one as a raging success. There were massive street protests. The president seemed to misplace the queen at one point, and he insulted his host, badly so. He told the Sun newspaper that Theresa May's arch rival Boris Johnson would be a great prime minister, and he accused her of messing up Brexit. It left the so-called special relationship a little tattered, and just when Britain needed it most. A year later, and Britain feels just as needy, maybe even more so, right in the middle of a full-on, cold, red, Brexit-fueled existential crisis. 
The fear is Trump will wade in and pour a whole boatload of salt on an open wound. It really does beg a belief that at this moment in particular, the government is planning to roll out the red carpet. Protesters are planning to roll out this guy again, floating baby Trump, and key political figures have declined invites to a state dinner in Trump's honor. It all has the feel of the perfect storm brewing. So how to calm it? We asked an expert how British diplomats should be preparing for the second coming of Donald Trump. Because I think the worst thing to do is to consider him to be a mixture of a villain and a buffoon and to be treated accordingly. Tip number two, bring in the royals and lots of them. A state visit is, is quite a thing. And then there'll be lots of soldiers marching around and chaps in uniforms. But will it actually be enough to warm up relations and make Britain feel just a little less alone as it prepares, or not, to leave the European Union? The May-Trump chemistry is notoriously bad. She's on her last legs, pledging to resign soon. But she'll still be the one to talk trade and security with Trump this week. Could another British politician get on better with Trump than Theresa May? Obviously, yes. He's expressed admiration for Boris Johnson, expressed admiration for Nigel Farage. But will he try and see them when he's here? And if he does, will it just be seen as one more attempt to interfere in British politics? Bojo, as he's known here, by the way, is one of the front runners in the contest to replace Theresa May as leader of the Conservative Party, and so the country. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Now, full state visits like this are really very rare. Trump is only the third U.S. president to get one. His packed schedule will include a lot of face time with the Queen, which is exactly what he wants. But along with the splash of this visit, there is some real substance to deal with. Getting what you want in the blink of an eye. Top of the list is what happens with the world's largest telecom company, Chinese giant Huawei. The UK is considering letting Huawei build some of its 5G network. That is a next generation network the globe craves with speeds to make driverless cars possible. Problem is the US blacklisted Huawei, convinced it could be a vehicle for espionage by the Chinese government. We believe this sets a dangerous precedent. And yes, this is part of the US-China trade spat. Canada understands that tension. It's Huawei's senior executive, after all, arrested in Vancouver on request of the U.S. Canada paid dearly for that. The U.K. might pay too. Donald Trump says if the British allow Huawei to get involved in 5G here, he will end intelligence sharing between the U.K. and the U.S. The Internet of the future must have Western values embedded within it. In national security circles, that is a mind-blowing threat. Given the UK, the US, Australia, New Zealand and Canada make up the so-called Five Eyes intelligence network, a decree like Trump's could sting Canadians too. Be prepared for that subject to dominate at a news conference here on Tuesday. Not the only hot topic, but one that definitely burns. And Donald Trump, being Donald Trump, he has already stoked some pre-visit flames. Paul Hunter looks at that. The message in this new ad for Britain's Sky News Network seems ominously clear, with shadows falling over everything British, even the Queen. The cut line, he's back. Trump, the baby blimp, in diapers. <laughs> and as Britain braces, Trump, meanwhile, is talking about everything. In an interview with the Sunday Times, he gave this advice to Britain on Brexit talks. If you don't get the deal you want, the fair deal, uh, then you walk away. And he supported Brexit hardliner Nigel Farage, who's called okay, Theresa May Britain's the worst Obama ever Obama prime minister. I like Nigel a lot, and I think he's got a lot to offer. Yeah, I think sure he's an know. asset to your yeah. country. Last week, Trump seemed to take on Meghan Markle, the American-born actress, now Duchess of Sussex. He spoke with the Sun tabloid Friday. She said she'd move to Canada if you got elected. Turned out she moved to Britain. Well, that would be good. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people moving here. So what can I say? No, I didn't know that she was nasty. For all of the above and more, many in Britain are aghast. 
London's mayor, Sadiq Khan, today likened Trump to a 20th century fascist who's flat out not worthy of red carpet treatment in Britain. Why do I say that? I think uh, our closest ally is akin to a best friend. And the thing about a best friend is, of course, you stand shoulder to shoulder with them at times of adversity, but you've got to call them out when you think they're wrong. And there are so many things uh, about President uh, Donald Trump's policies that are the antithesis of our values in London, but also our values as a country. On his way to the UK tonight, Trump denied saying, as he put it, any bad comments about Meghan Markle. He also told reporters that he expects the trip will be very interesting. Few doubt that. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Okay, so Adrian, Donald Trump obviously going to dominate uh, the news agenda over the next few days, but later this week, people there and here at home will mark a momentous occasion. Absolutely. We're talking about June 6, 1944. That was D-Day, the beginning of the end of the Second World War. There is a lot of sacrifice in the sand of those beaches in Normandy. Some 14,000 Canadians stormed Juneau Beach in particular. So that is where we will be on Thursday, incredibly, along with some of the veterans who served that day. Okay, looking forward to that coverage and your coverage all week. Thanks, Adrian. And on Thursday, as Adrian mentioned there, CBC News will have full coverage marking that 75th anniversary of D-Day, hosted, of course, by Adrian. Our special starts at 5 a.m. Eastern, and it will be both on CBC Television, CBC News Network, and you can live stream it on cbcnews.ca and, of course, on GEM. We are watching a developing story in the Ottawa area tonight. Wolf, take the kids, go in the basement. Here. At least one tornado touched down in the region. High winds tore through the Orleans area, that's in the eastern end, early this evening, causing some pretty severe damage to homes. No injuries have been reported. There are reports that there was another possible tornado in nearby Gatineau, Quebec. And the winds were blowing back and forth for Toronto Raptors fans tonight in a hard-fought battle against the Golden State Warriors in Game 2 of the NBA Finals. Van Fleet, Danny, triggers a three. No, and that's going to do it. Golden State takes game two of the NBA Finals. In the end, the wins went with Golden State. It did look like the Raptors game in the first half, but the Warriors were on fire in the second, dominating play, nailing three-pointers, and controlling the pace pretty well, and as you saw, just winning. Okay, let's check in again with Greg Ross at Jurassic Park. So that was sort of not as fun. How are fans doing right now? Yeah, well, for the first time in six games, Rosemary, fans leave Jurassic Park without celebrating. They just kind of walked out with their heads down. Obviously a disappointing uh, finish in this game for Raptors fans. 109 to 104 was the final score. Golden State evens this series up at one game apiece as they head to Oakland for game three of this series. I've got some sad fans that did stick around to talk to me here. Obviously, uh, that was a tough one to watch, especially considering the Raptors seem to be in control for the first half of that game. Yeah, it really was. Uh, we fell apart in the whole second half. We fell apart in the first two quarters of the game. We picked up in the third quarter, and then the fourth quarter we started to slack a bit more. It was just, it was, I mean, do you guys still have the confidence that you had coming into this game? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we won game one. I feel like we have the confidence to take game two, especially without a uh, Kevin Durant and Iguodala doesn't really have the capabilities right now. And Clay Thompson did go down. He didn't go down pretty hard, but he definitely didn't have his game you're at the feeling, end. You're feeling like the Raptors can bounce back from I think so, but we have to win one of their games, either game three or game four. I prefer really think that game three is a must well, that's going to be the important thing, uh, Rosemary. The, the Raptors now have to go out on the road. They have to play in a very tough building and they have to try to find a way to steal a game on the road in this series. We'll see if they can get it done uh, in the next uh, in the next week. Those are some pretty sad faces, Greg Ross. More fun when we win, that's for sure. Thanks for this, Greg Ross in Jurassic Park tonight. We'll have more on the Raptors tonight in spite of that, uh, including our Sunday interview with Glenn Grunwald. And later in our moment, the price of history, one Australian super fan recounts his journey. Oh, about five grand probably by the time I walk away, minus a beer or two. Yeah, so expensive.
there are times when you get um, inexcusable service uh, and it's completely unpredictable flight after flight. I dread entering Canadian airspace for that reason. Some strong words based on personal experience from an advocate for people with disabilities. He says voluntary codes of practice by airlines just aren't good enough to protect vulnerable travelers. And tonight, two families are telling our Go Public team harrowing stories of their own. As Rosa Marcatelli found out, they're demanding answers after they say their elderly parents were abandoned at the airport for hours. Mohan Karki's parents have trouble walking and they don't speak English. So when they wanted to travel from their home in Nepal to see him in Edmonton, he requested wheelchairs and special assistance through the airlines, WestJet and Cathay Pacific. They made it as far as Vancouver but failed to arrive in Edmonton. We were just thinking they were somewhere in the corner of the airport or just uh, sitting there. Uh, not knowing where to go. For more than 12 hours, neither airline could tell Karki where his parents were. Cathay Pacific told him they'd been dropped off at the WestJet counter at the Vancouver airport for their final flight. WestJet told them there was no sign of the pair. Your parents had been missing for more than 12 hours. No food, no water, no washroom breaks. Did you ever get an explanation? I, I, never, I, never, uh, I never got any explanation. He says he gave up on the airlines and called RCMP. It took officers just 20 minutes to find the couple, confused in their wheelchairs and just steps from the WestJet counter. She was scared and shaky. The same thing at the same airport happened to Tang Fan's 76-year-old mother on her trip home to Vietnam. He says a WestJet employee dropped her off at the wrong departure gate. My mom told me that the uh, wheelchair attendant just left her there without talking to anyone. He says she was in that wheelchair for almost eight hours until an employee from a different airline found her. It is appalling treatment that should never happen in Canada. David Leposky is an advocate for people with disabilities. He says assistance services are unreliable because airlines set their own rules. The rules should make it clear that, and the regulators should make it clear that they can't pass the buck to each other. The regulator, the Canadian Transport Agency, hopes to have legally binding regulations in place by next summer, with penalties for travel providers who break the rules. The goal is to provide seamless assistance from the time people arrive at the airport until the end of their trip. They need to make sure that passengers don't fall between the cracks. Cathay Pacific says it followed protocol when it handed Mohan Karki's parents over to WestJet. WestJet apologized for what happened to both families. The two airlines are now conducting internal reviews. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. If you've got a story idea or a tip for our Go Public team, you can reach them at gopublic at cbc.ca. Still ahead on The National, with Raptors fever reaching new heights, Ian sits down with the teamer's former general manager to talk about their rise and the state of basketball in Canada. We're the most popular sport amongst uh, young people, most popular sport among new newcomers to Canada. The basketball emoji is the most popular uh, uh, emoji on Twitter. A huge basketball fan, the former president of the United States of America, Barack Obama, here. We'll see if President Obama can help the Warriors out, assuming that's who he's supporting. The Raptors are not NBA champions yet, but don't tell these fans. The Raps' long road to this point has taken years and was laid down in part by this man. Former GM Glenn Grunwald helped build the modern Raptors machine. But if Grunwald changed the Raptors, Canada changed him. Born in the U.S., he is now a proud Canadian citizen with a full-on commitment to growing basketball in this country. Ian sat down with Glenn Grunwald in Vancouver. When the Raptors were introduced to the world in 1994, Basketball Hall of Famer Isaiah Thomas was brought in as the star executive. His old college teammate, Glenn Grunwald, by his side. By 1997, Grunwald took over as general manager as the team struggled. You know, we would have had more wins this year uh, with, you know, less injuries. Q. Vince Carter. Vince Carter! Oh, no! No, I've seen everything! Grunwald orchestrated Carter's arrival in Toronto. Oh! 
triggering an explosion of the game across Canada. Under Grunwald, the Raptors made the playoffs three times, and he oversaw the team through some critical years of growth. After seven years with Toronto, Grunwald went on to work with a number of other NBA teams, but now he's back, this time as the president and CEO of Canada Basketball, overseeing the women's and men's national teams and celebrating the Raptors' rise to the NBA Finals. I met up with Glenn Grunwald here in Vancouver. So Glenn, thank you very much for joining us. Ian, thanks for having me. What do you think of our studio? This is the world's best studio. Basketball, beach, sun, uh, what an awesome day. Yeah, absolutely. So you represent a link to a, a previous generation of Raptors. And I'm curious, from your perspective, how have you felt as, as the team has advanced through the playoffs? Just so happy. Like, it's, it's great to see the, the fruition of a lot of hard work from a lot of people. Uh, building the basketball professional level here and then seeing how the nation reacts to the success that the Raptors are, are having right now. You were the general manager during, among other things, the Vince Carter era, the first true superstar, I suppose, of the, of the Toronto Raptors. And I've heard that he had a real impact on, on young Canadian basketball players. Tell us about that. Well, he was a great role model. And uh, not only was he a very talented player, he was a good person too. But he showed the excitement and joy that basketball can bring to both players and coaches and participants and fans. So I think that really energized the basketball community to see what could happen with basketball. And now you see it happening, you know, with this Raptors playoff run. It, it's been so exciting and, and so many people have gotten uh, joy out of it. It's great to see. And you're the CEO of Basketball Canada. So give me in a one paragraph, I guess, the state of, of amateur basketball in Canada. Canada right now? Well, it's growing dramatically. Uh, you know, we're the most popular sport amongst uh, young people, most popular sport among new newcomers to Canada. The basketball emoji is the most popular uh, uh, emoji on Twitter. So lots of great things are happening and our, and our national teams are doing so well now. Our women's, are ranked, our women's national team is ranked fifth in the world. Our men's team just qualified for the World Cup in China this coming September and we're going to have a lot of NBA players on it. And we have, we have more NBA players, 13, uh, in, from Canada playing in the NBA than any other country in, in, in the world, except for the U.S., of course. of course. And then we're going to have the NBA draft coming up, and we expect to have as many as eight players drafted. So even more Canadians will be in the NBA next year. It's, it's just great to see. In professional sports, we're used to having star players from other cities or other countries who are, who are playing for the hometown team. So, for example, in hockey, lots of captains in the NHL uh, from Sweden on Canadian teams. What was it like when you were the general manager of the Raptors to try to get players who aren't from Canada to connect to Toronto and Canada? Well, I think that's one of the things that's happened over the course of time. Not only have our fans become better fans for basketball, but NBA players and the basketball community agents and, and other teams see, see how great uh, Canada is and how great Toronto is and what a great sports community it is. But it must depend on who the person is, obviously, and maybe the era. Because I remember hearing stories about Grizzlies who came to Vancouver and, and they would say, hey, there's no ESPN here. Or, you know, do you even have cable TV? And they, they kind of seem to be visitors, some of them, during yeah. the season. You must have had some of those challenges as well with, with the yeah, Raptors. Yeah, it's an education. It's a growing process. and, and and it's, you know, now I don't think that issue exists anymore. I would like your perspective on the current Raptors, but with a twist, not about how they're doing on the court. There are lots of sports channels that can talk about that. But as you see the kind of people who are Raptors right now and what you can see of them off the court, tell me about that part of it. Well, like I said, uh, we're the most popular sport among newcomers. And, and sport uh, it has a unique ability to bring people together into a community and to, to, to celebrate the success and I guess sharing some of the pain too when, when things don't go as well as you want. But, but that's what's great about sports and, and that's why it's so wonderful to see the diversity of the population and the fans and, and uh, that are coming out to the Air Canada Centre in Jurassic Park and, and really coming together as one. Uh, you know, one of my best stories was the, the first game of the Toronto Raptors in 1995 was a few days after the referendum where Quebec was trying to separate. I was new to Canada, I didn't quite understand what was going on. But, that, but when the fans came together, the bare naked ladies sang the national anth anthem. And when they switched to the French lyrics in the middle of that anthem, the crowd just erupted. And it was like, that was the, my most memorable moment of, of how these Canadians came together at a sporting event and celebrated their community. I'm curious about what it's like to build a team in Toronto, and this you definitely would have insight in, in terms of trying to get superstars to come to a place like Toronto in free agency. 
I would think there was a time that was probably a hard sell. I wonder if now with their success, with Drake on the sidelines, with the, the whole culture of the Raptors, do you think it's different for the general manager now? I think it's better now. First of all, Masai and his team have done a, just a tremendous job of building the organization and creating this, this playoff run and this potentially championship team. Uh, so I think that's part of it. People want to go to a winning environment and, and certainly there's some things we can't overcome in Canada, like the weather. If you're, if you're destined to stay in a warm weather environment, well, that's, we can't change that. But everything else, I think, has shown that Toronto and Canada is a great place to play professional sports. Kawhi up top, looks at the clock, turns the corner for the win! Kawhi Leonard's three-pointer in Game 7. Do you think you'll see dividends in Canadian basketball from that? Oh, definitely. First of all, we're going to have a, a generation of kids that have practiced the corner three-pointer trying to make four bounces and get it to go in. But no, it's, it's an iconic moment. I think that'll be replayed for, for decades to come and, and remembered as one of the great sports moments in basketball and in Canada. So yeah, I think we're going to have more fans appreciating the game, more players playing the game, and just more, more appreciation for, for how fun basketball can be. How do you think the finals are going to turn out? Well, I'm optimistic. I think the Raptors match up pretty well. We beat them twice in the regular season. And uh, even though they're an experienced veteran team, well, so are we. You know, so are the Raptors. They've got a lot of good veterans. We haven't played together as long as they have, but we've got a good, good playoff experience. And I think, I think we have a, a reasonably good chance to upset the champs. So one of the interesting connections between Golden State and the Raptors, obviously, is Steph Curry. His dad, Dell, uh, played when you were the general manager. So you saw Steph as a kid. He was amazing as a kid. I'll tell you what, he, he was a halftime entertainment. He would come out and drain threes. He was a little seventh grader or whatever he was, and he could always shoot. And, and it was he was just draining threes in grade seven? Un, not just draining them, consistently. He was an un, unbelievable shooter as, even as a youngster, and, and people would, would just pay to, to watch him shoot. He was so good. So he's, he's an incredible talent, and uh, it was fun to see him as a youngster, and uh, now to see where he's become, it's, it's really unbelievable. So that makes you chair a little bit for uh, Golden? Golden State? Not at this time. <laughs> uh, I am a Steph Curry fan, but uh, at this time I'm sort of rooting against him. What's next for basketball in Canada, for the team that you're involved in, the national men's and women's team? Well, we have the Men's World Championship coming up uh, and taking place in, in China in September. So we'll, we'll assemble a team uh, that we think will be comprised primarily of NBA players. And we think we'll, we'll have an excellent chance to qualify for the Olympics out of that. Our women's team, on the other hand, is, is to play in three tournaments over the course of the next year to qualify for the Tokyo Olympics. And we're very optimistic they'll be able to do that. In the meantime, our under-19 team is, is defending the World Championship. We're the gold medal, the best team in the world for the under-19 age category, and we're playing in Crete in July to defend that championship. And then we have a lot of other competitions going on. Uh, you know, so much stuff to, to talk about. Three on three basketball is another new sport in the Olympics. So we're, we're trying to qualify for that as well. So lots of things going on, national championships, clubs, referees. We're, we're just trying to build the sport and make it even better. You seem excited about Canadian basketball. It, it's a great time to be involved in Canada basketball and, and our, our best days are ahead of us. All right, very nice speaking with you. Ian, my pleasure. Thank you. Always good weather out there for that Ian guy. Still ahead on the National, inside Project 44, the mapping initiative shedding new light on the Normandy invasion some 75 years later. This is closure. It helps put things in perspective. And that's, that's amazing. That's next, but first. In case you missed it, one of Canada's most celebrated performing arts venues is currently being celebrated. The National Arts Centre is marking its 50th anniversary. Now a globally recognized institution, the NAC was effectively willed into being by one famously determined Canadian. Journalist, war hero and diplomat, Hamilton Southam believed the dynamic young country deserved a world-class performing arts space. He convinced then Prime Minister Lester Pearson to back the project. And in 1969, Pearson's successor presided over its opening. Plato believed that if the rulers were surrounded by beauty, they would make just law. At the least, after a few visits here, we should be able to improve our performances and that other publicly supported playhouse across the street. <gasps> 
two-week opening festival was a bit of a mixed bag. Technical problems with the orchestra, questionable performances, and at least one play that utterly bombed. But things improved quickly. And the center itself was an instant hit. Colossal in scale, ultra modern and luxurious. The NAC has gone through several updates through the years. Aesthetically and artistically, always with a focus on growth. So, hey, next time you're in Ottawa, it is yours after all. Ottawa is closing its embassy in Venezuela, at least temporarily, and pulling Canadian diplomats out of the country. Foreign Affairs Minister Christia Freeland blames the Maduro regime, saying it refused to extend diplomatic visas and limited the ability of foreign embassies to function. Canada is a vocal supporter of Venezuelan opposition leader Juan Guaido and has called on Nicolas Maduro to step down. As a wildfire rages near the Pekantikum First Nation in northwestern Ontario, the number of people who've been flown out has grown now to about 1,500. Those most vulnerable to smoke, like children and seniors, were among the first to be airlifted. Evacuees are now being sheltered in Winnipeg, Thunder Bay and Timmins. We have some excellent news today. We want to tell everybody that, yes, you can come home. Residents of high-level Alberta and surrounding areas have been waiting two weeks to hear that. They can start coming home tomorrow morning, but an evacuation alert will still be in place, meaning people need to be ready to leave at a moment's notice. The Chuck Egg Creek fire that's been threatening the community is still out of control. It scorched more than 280,000 hectares. Because if there ever was a time that we needed God, we need him right now. A vigil held tonight in Virginia Beach, Virginia, for the 12 victims of Friday's mass shooting. Investigators say they still don't know why a city engineer walked into the municipal building where he worked and opened fire. They did debunk earlier reports, though, that the man was fired, now saying he had actually resigned hours before the attack. As the 75th anniversary of D-Day approaches, we'll show you how a group of volunteers has traced where Canadian regiments ended up during that crucial campaign. Their digital project brought together countless wartime details for the very first time. As Murray Brewster shows us, it's let one family finally uncover the truth about their own lost soldier. The massacre at Abbey Ardain. For Greg Pollard, it was a war crime that wounded more than one generation. The details of what happened, we didn't get. Yeah. Lance Corporal George Pollard of Cornwall, Ontario, murdered on the 17th of June, 1944. His body never recovered. The commander of the 12th SS Panzer Division was tried as a war criminal and sentenced to prison in 1945. George Pollard's family, including his mother, Ethel, watched the trial with horror and disbelief. She would not believe that he was murdered, even though she had all the documents, uh, all, all the newspaper clippings. My dad, his sister, George's brothers, grew up with my grandmother telling us, George is still alive. George is not dead. No body, he's not dead. My grandmother lived 99 years thinking that he was coming through the kitchen door. Greg Pollard is George Pollard's nephew. Haunted by his grandmother's grief, he spent two decades researching the fate of his uncle and the doomed patrol that led to his capture. To unravel the mystery, he needed a map and the help of three unlikely friends who share a passion for military history and who have embarked on an extraordinary project to retrace Canada's Normandy campaign. They have spent months rummaging through boxes at Library and Archives Canada, poring over records not seen in three quarters of a century and digitizing them. If you can see right here, this is a unit narrative for, I want to say, Fifth uh, Field Company, Royal Canadian Engineers. All these units would have been keeping this diary daily right until the war ended. Tens of thousands of documents, 
this is all, all poured into this. A digital interactive map that tracks the movements day by day of every Canadian regiment that fought in the Normandy campaign. So, June 17th with the William Pollard Patrol. This is the storm at Dundas Glengarry Highlanders. Somewhere in this field is where that patrol would have been machine gunned. So, uh, Lieutenant Williams and uh, Lance Corporal Pollard would have been left out in this field and then captured by the Germans. Nathan Kelleher knows the cold fear of war. He's a reservist and map maker, but served with the Royal Canadian Dragoons, the tanks, in Kandahar, and hopes to someday digitally map that campaign. Having served in Afghanistan, one day I'm going to have to tell my kids my story, and I want to have a way of showing that. But before I develop a project like that, I, I feel I need to do this project first. It was in the area. But to be able to properly tell this story, he had to speak to someone who was there. This is the uh, front line, so to speak. Former warrant officer George Fouchard, 97. A cartographer in the Canadian Army during the Second World War, he drew the maps Canadian troops used on Juneau Beach and throughout the Normandy campaign. The Army can get along with, without any underwear, but they can't get along without any maps. The team wanted George's insight. They were surprised many of the maps they pulled from the archives were the ones that he had drawn, maps George had not seen in 75 years. I mean, overall, that really helped the soldiers at the front, because we've talked about before, the Germans, they didn't have the quality of maps that no. we had. The quality and superiority of Allied maps was, in George's estimation, an underappreciated key to victory. Because that's what, uh, you know, the higher-ups had to know was where these people were. And it comes right down to the soldiers that they want to know what, where they're going and what they're doing. And that leads us back to Greg Pollard, the SS massacre at Abbey Ardain, and a reproduction of the map his murdered uncle's patrol would have used the night they were captured. This is closure. It helps put things in perspective. And that's, that's amazing. I'm just glad we could help. And like the Allies, the project team does not intend to stop in Normandy. They plan to digitally map the entire Canadian campaign in Europe in time for VE Day anniversary celebrations next year. Marie Brewster, CBC News, Ottawa. It's a pretty incredible project. Up next on The National, from Melbourne, Australia to Toronto, the NBA Finals couldn't keep this diehard Raptors fan down under. So the result, I rang my wife, said, uh, and she said, oh, you need to go. I said, come again. I said, if they win, you need to go. And I'm not one to argue, so next thing I knew, I was buying a, had to quickly check with the boss, and then I was buying a ticket to get over to Canada. So his long and very, very costly journey, wait till you find out, to game two. That's next in our moment. The Toronto Raptors are making history on the court and growing the team's fan base in a way we've never seen. People are behind the wraps all across this country and apparently maybe even the Commonwealth. Sometimes people fall hard for a sport. Sometimes it's merely a passing crush, but sometimes it becomes an obsession they'll cross the world for. Meet the Raptors' biggest fan down under in our moment. We won. I was actually at work. I noticed that we'd won. Just quickly stepped out for a five minute break. Saw the result. I rang my wife said, uh, and she said, oh, you need to go. I said, come again? I said, if they win, you need to go. And I'm not one to argue, so next thing I knew, I was buying a, had to quickly check with the boss, and then I was buying a ticket to get over to Canada. Uh, I can't believe it, very surreal. Just standing here, um, which I've been watching on TV for the last 15 years, now to be finally here, it's, yeah, it's fantastic. I used to go to the games here when there was only um, about 30, 30 win seasons, and oh, first I loved basketball, so I never really had a team, but then when I came to Toronto, I just fell in love with the Raptors. I watched about a dozen games here, um, and then just the love just I kept on following when I got back home to Australia. You have basketball games in Australia on ESPN, but only the big name teams, you know, the Spurs, the Lakers, the Knicks, etc. So when NBA League Pass came on, I would basically, you could watch every single Raptor game. To say that you've been to watch the Raptors in the NBA Finals is yeah, definitely worth it and say I've been here. And as my wife said, you, you never know when uh, this may happen again. So yeah, so it's definitely worth it. My wife is the quote, the greatest wife of all time. 
She doesn't like me saying that, so I apologise. So she's fantastic. Uh, I married the right woman. The plan is here till game five, and then I'm flying out the following day. So Raptors in five. It's a sign. <laughs> So that's a lot of money, but two things. At least he recognizes how lovely his wife is to say, go ahead and spend all their money on the Raptors game. And he points out that if it goes past a game five, he has to go home because he will get end up divorced. So anyway, super fans, they're everywhere. That is the National for June 2nd. Have a good night, everybody.